In his own words, Lucifer reveals his remarkable strategies and future plans. Have you ever wondered about having a conversation with the embodiment of evil, Lucifer? Exploring the secrets hidden within his plans and strategies? The Bible provides insights into this enigmatic figure responsible for malevolence and demonic forces. In this presentation, we delve into an intriguing interview with Lucifer himself. But before we do that, it's paramount that you understand who you are in Christ Jesus. It's important to acknowledge that while Lucifer is a formidable foe, there's no need to fear him. Despite his might, he falls short of being omnipotent, omniscient, or omnipresent. He's created, not divine, and his power is limited by God's sovereignty. A biblical verse in Job 1 verse 7 reveals that he roams the earth within bounds set by God. Christians can resist his influence, as stated in James 4 verse 7, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Even though he's intelligent and powerful, he can't stand against the faith of believers. However, a warning exists against giving the devil a foothold, mentioned in Ephesians 4 verse 27. Now, let's discuss some tactics that Satan employs against Christians. He tempts, deceives, accuses, afflicts, opposes, and seeks to bring death. But we have hope, for Jesus triumphed over Satan, death, and the forces of evil. Revelation 12 verse 11 highlights how believers overcome by the blood of the Lamb, their testimony, and not loving their lives even in the face of death. The plans and strategies of Satan has not changed from that used against Adam and Eve. The Bible have admonished us about it but some believers undermine this or think oh that was then, not understanding that heaven and earth may pass away but the word of God remains in its authenticity, reality and spirituality, from generation to generation, 1 Peter 1 25. The plans and strategies used by Satan is found in 1 John 2 verse 16 for all that is in the world the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father but is of the world. This is the interview with Satan, obviously using the voice of a human, in a social media platform. Let's listen to his mind in this extract. Hit notification, subscribe and share for the word of God to grow and prevail. Acts 19 verse 20. Interviewer, okay, first let's talk about your reign. Now you've had a fairly long one. What would you attribute to your success and popularity? Satan, oh, that's easy. Throughout generations, the pattern remains consistent. I exploit their desires for lust and self-importance. I dangle before them all the allure of sex, wealth, and fame. Do as you wish has always been my campaign mantra. And my stance hasn't changed a bit. I consistently focus on the same three issues every era, the cravings of the flesh, the allure of possessions, and the arrogance of life. Interviewer, all right, all right. When you refer to lust of the flesh, what exactly are you getting at? Satan, come now, you must know. Isn't it glaringly evident? I take advantage of humanity's inherent physical desires and manipulate them. Since sexual longing often proves to be the most potent, I frequently center my efforts there. While I didn't create sex, I must admit I've skillfully distorted it. Just consider obscene materials. Well. You're quite familiar with this, Ivan, weren't you once ensnared by it? Interviewer, this interview is about you, not myself. Can we please get back on track? Satan, now, where were we? Ah uh, yes, my method involves gradually ensnaring someone in the clutches of obscene materials effect and they can no longer suppress their urges, they inevitably seek to enact their fantasies on others, and occasionally, even on young people. This is where my plan unfolds flawlessly. Those victimized often spiral into a life of debauchery and deviance, enabling me to perpetuate my destructive cycle. And here's the twist, many of those girls who were abused end up in the very obscene materials the industry. Quite the ironic outcome, wouldn't you agree? Interviewer, regarding the second point you brought up, I believe you mentioned lust of the flesh and lust of the eyes. Could you provide more insight? humans seem eternally dissatisfied. They incessantly yearn for more, bigger homes, larger cars, greater wealth, and increased power. The list is endless. 
I capitalize on the natural aspirations, twisting them into destructive forces. My strategy hinges on cultivating perpetual discontent. As long as I can keep them lusting after what others possess, I can manipulate them into arguments, conflicts, and even violence to attain it. Humans prove remarkably susceptible to falling into the trap of jealousy, and you know what they say, jealousy is as merciless as the grave. Interviewer, moving on, you mentioned pride of life earlier. How does this factor into your campaign approach? Satan, humans are ceaselessly in pursuit of knowledge. I steered the earliest humans towards seeking carnal knowledge rather than godly wisdom, and this strategy has yielded success across generations. As knowledge grows, so does pride, and pride happens to be my expertise. Since humans tend to neglect God in their wisdom, I find it easy to entice them with various indulgences that inflate their egos. Lately, fame has become one of my best-selling offers. After all, who can resist attention and the feeling of superiority over others? Once I've elevated them to fame, I can effectively utilize them to advance my agenda with their enthusiastic assistance. I've successfully persuaded half the world not only to embrace sin, but to celebrate it openly. Do you want to know which pride campaign I've particularly relished? No, what is it? Well, my gay pride campaign, naturally. It affords me the opportunity not only to encourage your self-destruction, but also to co-opt God's emblem, the rainbow, for my purposes. Love is love, isn't it? My scheme not only curbs your feeble attempts at reproduction, but it also distorts gender roles, enabling me to unleash chaos and confusion upon your vulnerable societies. It has indeed yielded remarkable success. I've managed to convince men they're women and women they're men. Some have even adopted the belief that they're without gender altogether. Furthermore, I've got two additional pride campaigns in the pipeline for the near future. I suspect you're curious about their details, correct? To start, there's the Abortion Pride Initiative. I believe society is now primed for this. I've been collaborating with Planned Parenthood to handle marketing and promotions. Our aim is to silence the voices of pro-lifers and abolitionists since the rest of the church appears indifferent. The second initiative, which I'll postpone for now, is child abuse pride. Society might not be quite ready, so I'll need to further desensitize them before its introduction. Interviewer, shifting gears briefly, let's talk about policy. I understand so many of you are policies as destructive or hazardous. While this conversation may venture into offensive territory, I invite you to listen with an open heart. In response, what would you say to your critics? Satan, all our policies are designed to achieve one of three objectives, theft, death, or destruction. If an initiative doesn't fulfill one or all three of these criteria, it isn't aligned with my agenda, and I won't endorse it. Interviewer, alright, I appreciate your transparency. It seems you tailor your strategies to different ethnic groups. Is that accurate? Satan, absolutely, and it's a calculated approach. Let's take, for instance, the case of black individuals. They possess a strong spiritual connection. It's not feasible to entirely negate the concept of God. Instead, my focus lies in redirecting their faith, convincing them that the God they believe in isn't the God of the Bible. I've been quite successful in promoting concepts like black consciousness and Islam within their communities. I'm glad you brought up the topic of black people. It's true that they've held a prominent place on my agenda for some time. There are a few reasons for this emphasis. Firstly, they serve as a conduit to reaching the masses. In my previous role overseeing music in heaven, my compositions garnered significant attention, I even persuaded a considerable number of angels to follow me. Upon my arrival on Earth, I sought the assistance of artists and entertainers to propagate my message. Who could be more fitting than black individuals? They possess an inherent sense of rhythm and musical talent, and my ability to influence them is enhanced by their historical financial disparity. Another rationale behind targeting black people is their mental and physical strength. I recognize that if black men were to rediscover their identity in Christ, it could jeopardize my position. Consequently, I endeavor to dismantle the structure of the black family and distance black men from their families and places of worship. 
That's the end of the extract. In conclusion, reflecting on the intricacies of the rewritten insights about the devil's tactics, it reminds us of the importance of vigilance, discernment, and unwavering faith in our journey as believers. The devil's crafty ways, as described, seek to exploit our weaknesses, sow discord, and distort the truths we hold dear. Yet, within these revelations lies a profound call to arms, an opportunity to fortify our resolve against the forces that challenge our faith. As we navigate a world marked by temptation, division, and spiritual warfare, let us hold fast to the truths illuminated by our faith in the Word of God that never fails. Recognize the devil's schemes for what they are, attempts to lure us away from the path of righteousness and ensnare us in the allure of worldly desires. Armed with the Word of God, let us resist his advances, remembering that through the blood of Christ, we have the power to overcome. When doubt and fear knock at your door, stand firm in your faith. Cling to the promises of God, and remember that even in the darkest of times, His grace and mercy are unending. Trust that He is with you, guiding your steps and providing you with the strength to endure. In times of hardship, remember that God is using challenges to shape you and refine your character. Embrace these trials as opportunities for growth, knowing that through perseverance, you will emerge stronger and more resilient. God bless you.